Hey ladies, last time, oops, we left off, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about animals today. Are you talking about me today? Yeah, I'm talking about me today, thank you. That was Shania Aglosolos, how do you see your last name? Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, animals today, right ladies? Okay, so we left off, if you remember, looking at... Um, the I think it was bilaterians animals that have a left and right side so just to review quickly uh, one thing you have to know how to do is how to read these uh, trees so if I said to you what do uh, earthworms which are here, and what do grasshoppers, which are an example of an arthropod, what do they have in common? So one is they're bilateral. Another one would be they have tissues like muscle and nerve. Wherever you have a branch point that includes them, you could say that they have that, right? So, for example, you'll have this branch point because anything above this branch point has it. So, uh, jellyfish have true tissues like muscle and nerve. Uh, earthworms, grasshoppers, and us, we have muscle and nerve. Anything above this branch point has a left and right side, so that includes everything except for the jellyfish and the jellyfish-like things, or sponges. So I want you to know how to read these trees, okay? So we left off looking at the bilaterians, which basically is this part of a cladogram or tree. And uh, you look at bilaterians, there are two types. There are the protostomes and then there's the deuterostomes. So we're going to look at the protostomes uh, first, okay? Now, the, we talked about the way it develops, okay? So this is a growing embryo, and what you see is that there's an opening that forms here, I like to think of the embryo like a little tennis ball, okay? So it's kind of hollow on the inside, and basically, imagine it's a, ten a tennis ball where we, we push in a tennis ball and it forms this, this indentation. So imagine it's a tennis ball. This tennis ball has three tissue layers. There's an outer layer, there's a middle layer, and then there's an inner layer. And I'll show you that uh, here. So you can see there's an outer layer, this is the outer layer, there's a middle layer, and actually this is not the picture I want to show you. It's actually, where is it? Here, this is the one, sorry. This is the one. Okay, so there's an outer layer, okay, then there's a middle layer, and then there's the uh, inner layer right here. And the thing about these layers is they give rise to different things. Like the outer, you don't need to know this, okay? I'm not going to test you on this, but just to understand, these layers, they will form different things. Like the outer layer becomes like your skin and your nervous system. The, uh, the inner layer becomes like the skeleton, okay? And then the middle layer becomes like your digestive system, stuff like that. Okay, so they, they differentiate into different body parts. But we're not going to talk about that, because that's a whole other topic. Yeah. All bilaterians, yeah. So, and we don't see this in jellyfish. They only have two layers, an outer layer and an inner layer. There's no middle layer. So they're, they're organized differently, okay? We talked about the way 
the the embryo develops. Like for example, a protostome, uh, when the cells develop, they form this spiral ring staircase. Whereas in a deuterostome, they kind of stack on top, so the arrangement's different. For protostomes, when if you think of this as a tennis ball, and you push in on the tennis ball, the first opening is the mouth. Whereas in deuterostomes, the first opening is actually the anus. So basically, what you're seeing is that there are two groups, protostomes and deuterostomes, and they, the, the way they develop is a little bit different. Okay? They just they don't develop exactly the same way, but they're pretty similar. They have a left and right side. They have three tissue layers, okay, uh, and they also have the beginnings of this cephalization. This means that what you start to see in these animals is basically a head region where you start to see the beginning of a brain. Okay, you don't see that in jellyfish, and that's because they don't have a, a left and right side. Okay, you start to see things with heads once you start to see things that have a left and right side, a front and a back. Once they have that symmetry, then you start to see basically the formation of a primitive brain. Okay, that's what this uh, refers to. So let's look at some examples of things that are protostomes. So we have things like flatworms. Okay, that's this group here. Okay, so you can see they have a left and a right side. You start to see basically concentration of uh, neurons, nerve cells in the front. That's where, like the beginning of a primitive uh, brain. Now, closely related to uh, this, which, which by the way is one of your specimens from your slide set. This is planaria, okay? So it's a flatworm. So very closely related to, and there are uh, some worms that are parasitic. Can you do you know what it means to be a parasite? Can we talk about this. Yeah, it's an organism that is made up of eukaryotic cells that likes to feed off or use other things. So I'll show you a really neat example of uh, two parasites. This is the uh, schistomycosis. Well, I try saying that really quick. Schistomosiasis. Okay. And so this is a parasite. Parasites, um, in this case, you're seeing a picture of a snail because this parasite tends to reside in snails. This is actually a pretty cool picture. This is the, uh, actually two Parasite. This is the female residing inside the male. So this is the male, and this is the female. It's kind of cool. Um, now the only reason that they would do this is for sexual reproduction. This is the life cycle. Okay, you can see the life cycle. You don't have to know the life cycle. Okay. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you can see the life cycle of this parasite includes snails and humans. So you can see that it lives part of its life cycle in snails and part of its life cycle in, in humans. Uh, a lot of parasites tend to do that. Even to think about the one that causes um, Chagas disease, part of its life cycle is in the kissing bug. And then part of its life cycle is in humans. Okay. Um, now a parasite does not want to kill hosts. The parasite wants to use the host. So here's a picture of a tapeworm. All right, the nasty little uh, critter. Again, closely related to uh, flatworms. So they have a left and right side, but they're simplified. Remember, sometimes you don't have to. Uh, you don't expect always things to become more complicated. Sometimes things evolve to become more simple. So this is uh, this is the, the head of the tapeworm. What it does is it anchors itself in the intestine. Does anyone know why it would do that? Why would why would it anchor itself? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's stealing your 
uh, food and nutrients. Now, I don't know if I have a picture. Oh, I do have a picture. Yes, okay. Uh, before I get to this picture, so here's the life cycle of the tapeworm. You can see it involves uh, not just one host. We can see cows and humans. Okay. Um, the tapeworm wants to get into your small intestines, and it takes away your nutrients. So, uh, not that I'm condoning this or I recommend this, but uh, a long time ago, and I'm not exactly sure of the date, uh, people were selling tapeworms as a way to lose weight. Wait, people would have pizza? It is messed up. <laughs> Tapeworms? Why well, you would? I would imagine the way they come out is, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So you eat them, you get them by eating tainted meat, but then you would poop them out, and eventually ends up finding its way back into, uh, into like the embryos will get uh, into the environment, then they be swallowed up by a cow, gets into the cow, you eat the tainted meat. And that's how the life cycle uh, continues. All right, so let's look at some other examples of uh, protists. So not protists, sorry, uh, protostomes. Mollusks. So mollusks um, also have a left and right side. Okay, they have three tissue layers: an outer, an inner, and a middle layer. Uh, the first opening in the embryo is the mouth followed by the anus later on. So here are some mollusks. Okay. Here are some mollusks. Here are some other pictures. So, do you recognize this? So this would be uh, basically in that group uh, of with mollusks. Okay. So this is a cephalopod. So this, the cephalopods include uh, squid, uh, octopus, uh, cuttlefish. These, if you remember, these are the things that can change color very, very well. I don't know if you remember that video I showed you a while ago. Annelids are also protostones. So these are, like, for example, your uh, things like earthworms, okay? But it also includes uh, things like leeches. Leeches are so gross that they like got caught. This is also a protostome. So remember, a protostome has a left and right side, has three tissue layers. When the embryo develops, the first opening is the mouth. You can think of an embryo that has a complete digestive system as one big tube that starts in the mouth and ends up where? In the anus. Okay. So what would this protostome belong to? What what group? This would belong to a group called the arthropods. Okay? So the arthropods are things that are segmented, meaning that they are made up of repeating units like this. So you can see it looks like just basically like a bunch of Lego blocks put together. That in, so this group includes crustaceans, like lobsters. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Seg segmentation is not just in crustaceans. Yeah. We're we're kind of segmented. We're we made up of like repeating body parts too. Uh, so, what what is this? This is not a crustacean, but what is it? <laughs> so, what would it belong to? So, it's an arthropod, but it's not a crustacean. So, crustacean is something like it's an insect. Very good, it's an insect, and that's when I, I think I asked you a question about uh, you know we wouldn't think twice about eating. One of these, but maybe not so much one of these. Even though they're they belong in the same group, they're both arthropods, okay? but still one is kind of tasty, and the other one is kind of disgusting. Um, 
Here is a, this is a millipede. This is a, have you guys ever seen like videos of giant centipedes? No. no? They're huge. They're huge. They're huge. They're huge. Yeah, they're very creepy. So, they also include things like dust mites. This, this group, the, the arthropods, specifically the insects, is probably the most successful group of animals. It's the most diverse and it's the most, uh, numerous. Think about how many things that we see that would fit into this group. Okay? Uh, all of the flies, all of the spiders, all of those centipedes, the dust mites. There are so many things that, uh, are, would fit in this, in this group. Now we have the deuterostomes. So we have the protostomes that develop a certain way. And then we have on the other side, we have the deuterostomes. And it includes, it includes these three things. Echinoderms, uh, hemichordates, and chordates. And we're going to focus on chordates, okay? So here's uh, an echinoderm. Looks something like this. Now, that looks like like no animal at all, right? It looks like like a bunch of feathers uh, stuck together. So if you remember, the defining one of the defining characteristics is being bilateral. I'm just sorry, being bilateral, right? It's a bilaterian, which means it has a left and right side. So what's the left and right side of this creature? And that includes, so this, these are starfish, right? So here we have a deuterostome eating a protostome. Because a, the mollusk is a protostome. What's the left and right side of a starfish? Uh, you can't tell. But here's the thing. This is the embryo. So when we say it's bilateral, it has to be bilateral at some point in its life. Okay? So what we see with... Uh, Things like starfish is, and even uh, the sand dollar is it's. It doesn't look bilateral. It looks radial, like a jellyfish. But at some point in its life, it was bilateral. Okay, it had a left and right side. So as a as a baby, as a larva, a little baby sand dollar or a little baby starfish, it had a left and a right side. This. So again, we're going to focus on uh, chordates, okay? So I'm going to kind of skip over uh, hemichordates. Um, so I'm going to skip. Talk about chordates. So that's the group that we belong to. And this is the one we're going to focus on. A chordate has four uh, very important characteristics that define it, okay? And here they are. One is they have a nerve cord that is in the back of the embryo. Okay. Two, they have a flexible rod called a notochord that is not the spinal column. Don't confuse it with the spinal column. Okay. It kind of looks like your backbone, but it ain't. But this notochord in us, actually, eventually deteriorates into the gel that we find in the spinal column or in the, in the backbones. Okay. So one is you have a nerve cord that runs in the back. You have this thing called a notochord, which kind of looks like a backbone, but it's not. And then you have what's called a post-anal tail. Now, what does post mean? Okay. So the tail comes after the anus. If you look at insects, the anus is actually at the end of a tail. Okay? So it's a different body plan. And then the other thing is you see this. Gill slits. Okay? These are little openings in the side of the uh, uh, organism that allows water to go through. Those are the four characteristics. What's interesting is if you look at insects, and there are a couple other things too. Um, let me add one more. Where's your heart? Right here. 
Well, would you say it's more in the front or in the back? Okay, it's in the front, right? So the heart of a the heart of a chordate. So the heart of a chordate would actually be in the front of the embryo. When you look at insects, it's different. When you look at an insect body plan, the heart is actually in the back, and the nerve cord is in the front. When you look at us, the nerve cord is in the back, and the heart is in the front. So there's an idea out there, and it, it's actually a, a pretty strong idea, that at some point, uh, the insect body plan was inverted, flipped over, and that eventually led to the uh, chordate body plan. So in other words, there's a very good chance that we may be upside down versions of insects. So there are genes that there are genes that actually determine the uh, left, sorry, the, the back and the front end of the insect. Remember we talked about uh, toolkit genes? It's the same genes that are being used in chordates, but they're just being expressed in the opposite sides. So the same genes that are building the back and front of the insects are building the back and front of chordates, but they've been flipped. So there's a good chance, I don't know if it's true, I mean, it good, but there's a good chance that we may just end up being uh, like upside down versions of, of insects. Okay, so here are some of the groups in, uh, in this group called chordates, okay? You can see probably one that you would recognize. Group that has what? Yeah, a backbone, vertebrates. Okay. Uh, so these guys do not have backbone, but they're they have those four characteristics. Okay, that we just uh, looked at. So one of them are the uro, uh, urochordates. These are the tunicates. These are things that look. This is kind of like their body plan. But this is what they look like as babies. This is the body plan. So this is actually the baby of a tunicate. So the baby and the adult look nothing like each other. Okay? Um, but when you look at the baby, it has those four characteristics, right? You see the nerve cord, the notochord, you see the gill slits, the openings, and you see a tail that goes past the anus. So these are the tunicates. This is a lancelet. So you can see the uh, characteristics of a lancelet. Do you re recognize this thing? Remember in the video, uh, your inner fish, they show this is uh, towards the end of the series. They talked about how these things, even though you don't really see a brain, they start to have the beginnings of a brain. They, they didn't use the word lancelet? No? Oh, amphioxus. Yeah, yeah. So that's, the, that's the name, amphioxus. Okay, so we're going to focus on chordates, but, and we're going to look at uh, our next cladogram. So, these are all chordates. Can you see this? Let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay. All right, so these are all things that have those four characteristics, right? They have a nerve cord in the back, they have a notochord in the back, they have the gill slits, and they have a tail that goes past the, the anus or the butt, right? These are the different types of chordates. So if I said to you, explain to me why fish is not a good group, what, what would you tell me? Yep, so for example, if I said to you uh, a coelacanth, so here's a coelacanth. Now, are we, are mammals and coelacanths more like each other? Or are coelacanths and sharks more like each other? So the shark would be right here. There's your shark. So here's the shark. Here's the coelacanth right here. 
and here are mammals. So what's the point that connects sharks with coelacanths? Where is it? It's right here. Okay, you see this? This point here? Okay. Well, what's the point that connects mammals with coelacanths? It's right here. So it's higher up. So this says that mammals and coelacanths are more like each other than coelacanths are like sharks. So fish is not a good group because there are some fish that are more like us than they are like other fish. So here are some of the characteristics that we, we can actually take chordates and we can break them down into chordates that have a vertebrae. So for example, does a lamprey, so lamprey looks something like this. This is a hagfish and they produce this really nasty slime. And this is a lamprey. So the lamprey is a thing that's feeding off this fish. So if we, was that? That's the mouth, yep. Yep. Now you'll notice the mouth doesn't open or close, it just, it stays open. Okay, so it doesn't have jaws. So if we go back to our cladogram. So the hagfish, which is right here, how would you distinguish it from a lamprey? What's different about the two? Yeah, so hagfish don't have a backbone, but lamprey, if you follow it, lamprey does. So the vertebrae is here. What makes the fish different than the lamprey? Presence of what? Any fish. Well, any fish on this cloud. <laughs> it's the presence of jaws. So we have hagfish that don't have backbones. We have lamprey that do but don't have jaws. And then we have things that have jaws. Like sharks have jaws. Um, tuna has, tuna fish has jaws. We have jaws. But here's the thing. If you go back to the cladogram, I know I'm jumping around a lot. Uh, what makes certain fish more like us than sharks? So it says here, lungs or swim bladder. Right? So anything above this point has lungs or swim bladder. So for example, this is a fish. This will look something like maybe that's in your aquarium. Now, do you think this has lungs? No. So it must have something called a swim bladder. So what's a swim bladder? All right, so a swim bladder is not found in sharks. You don't see it in sharks, but you see it here. So here's a swim bladder. Now, what the swim bladder does is it fills up with gas. And as it fills up with gas, the fish can rise up to the top of your aquarium. So any fish that can't just go up and down, any fish that can't go up and down like an elevator, if it has to literally force its way up like a shark, like sharks can't just go up and down. They have to literally swim up and swim down. These fish that have a swim bladder, they're like submarines. So they can basically, the swim bladder will allow them to go up. Because they will have, when, you fill, when it fills up with gas, the fish becomes lighter and it goes up. Or they can get rid of the gas and, and they can sink. Now, why would this characteristic, I want you to think about this for a second. Why would this characteristic, the swim bladder, make this fish more like us and not more like the shark? Because the shark doesn't have it. So what do you think it is? What do you think the swim bladder is homologous to? Very good. The lungs. Okay? The lungs and the swim, swim bladder are actually the same organ. It's just been modified over time. For us, we don't use the lungs to go up and down in the water. We use it to fill up the gas so we can get oxygen into our bloodstream. Okay, so here's the seal of cat. You remember this picture. All right. Then we have the tetrapods. So if we go back again to the cladogram, 
What unites these things? Four limbs. Okay? The presence of having four. And now, now think, do all living things have four limbs? No, because we know insects have six, spiders have eight. So the tetrapod, I'm actually going to come out of this now, uh, we know is a four limbed, what happened? Oh, there we go. Four limbed organism. Okay? So tetrapods, we know that they first evolved close to 400 million years ago. Number Tiktaalik, we're looking at about 380 million years ago. Okay? So they would have been, the first tetrapods would have been what? Amphibian like or reptile like? Yeah, amphibian like. That, that means that they have to live in a very moist environment because the eggs are not what? They're not protected, right? I put up a presentation on plants, and, and when you look at the evolution of plants, it's very, very similar to what happens with animals. The first animals that came out onto land did not have waterproof skin, and did not have waterproof eggs. The first plants that came out of the water also did not have all of the same mechanisms to prevent dehydration. Uh, and you'll see that when you watch the videos. Very strong parallel between the two. This... Now, how do you pronounce this? This is called a Sicilian. And it's spelled, I don't know if you can see it here. Not Sicilian, like in the, uh, the like being Italian. Okay, can you see I'll make it being a little bit bigger? So, kind of looks like an earthworm, but if I said to you that this thing develops in a way that the anus opens up first, then you know it can't be an earthworm because an earthworm is a what? It's a protostome, right? Kind of looks like a snake, but it doesn't lay an amniotic egg. In other words, the egg is not waterproof. So what is it? It's an amphibian. Okay, It's an amphibian. So this is similar to the frog. It has to be living in a very moist environment, um, and its eggs have to be laid in water, otherwise it dries out. Reptiles have the waterproof skin, and they have the waterproof egg. So they could lay their uh, eggs on water. And again, going back to plants, you see the same thing. Plants, land plants, the first land plants, their sperm and the egg, had to be in a watery environment. But if you think about plants like trees, where, where does the pollen go? In the air. It doesn't have to go in the water anymore. Okay? So there's a strong parallel here. So reptiles figure out a way to build an amniotic egg to be laid on land. Okay? Here are some examples of reptiles. Okay? Lizards. They would fall into that category. So with birds, there is a fossil of an early bird, okay? Here is a picture of something called Archaeopteryx. And you can see why birds should be included in reptiles. Because if you look at the earliest birds, what do you see that modern day birds don't have? You can see scales on the heads. You can see that if you look really closely, they have uh, teeth. You can see the teeth here. Okay. You can also see claws on their wings. Okay. And then we have mammals. That's the group that we belong to. So we know they're animals. They're bilateral. They have, they're chordates. They have backbones. They have jaws. But what defines a mammal? And what else? And what else? Their teeth. Remember, they have specialized teeth. Okay? And here are the different types of mammals. We have your monotremes. So this mammal actually lays eggs. Now, and you expect that because mammals evolve from egg-laying reptile-like things. Then we have your marsupials that don't lay eggs on land. When I say lay, I mean lay eggs on land. Okay? But their babies do not develop fully when they're born, 
so they're, they're kind of immature still. And then you have your mammals, where the baby develops totally internal. And then when they're born, they're fully uh, developed. So ladies, that is it for the survey on animals. The...